Uh, hello, everybody. And um, if you're watching this, it means, unfortunately, I can't be with you in person, and I'm very sorry about this, but I hope over the next 15 or so minutes to be able to share with you some of the kind of foundations of imagining futures that other colleagues will talk about in much more detail and also be writing about in much more detail um, over these couple of years to come. And it is also very much based on the hard work and tremendous energies that uh, have been brought together in creating a lot of these questions, environments, and dialogical spaces. So really my job now is just to give you some of the background to all of this happening. So thank you very much for including me in the conversation. Um, what I wanna do is start by giving you a little bit of the essence of what Imagining Futures is. And one way to capture it is through the question of who decides what gets to be remembered into the future. And the premise of Imagining Futures is that choices about what is to be remembered and forgotten, which draw on local knowledges and joint decision-making have a unique authority to counter stereotypes, gentrification, discrimination, overwriting, and to enhance the appreciation for shared stories and a community's place in the global context. We seek on the one hand to trace opportunities that archives create for celebration, for connectivity, overcoming erasure and healing trauma, but also recognizing their use as tools of exclusion, violence and oppression. Thus we see egalitarian archival practice as a dialogic space for negotiation about pasts and future visions, for existing diverse and divergent narratives that challenge any singular we. It is also about stories that are unfinished or displaced and the questions that they raise. For imagining, imagining futures, archival practices refer to what is tangible and intangible, whether documents, objects, dances, crafts, recipes, neighborhoods, or landscapes, and other things that we constantly being introduced to through the many works of Imagining Futures colleagues. A quite well-known archivist from South Africa, Baron Harris, outlines the expansiveness of archives and reasons why we should be concerned about the archive, or as Jack Derrida argued, be in need of archives, because it articulates a way of being in the world, and moreover, archives revolve around issues of accountability, identity, inclusivity, and social justice. In essence, in quote, there is no political power without control of the archive, if not memory. So for Imagining Futures is about seeing individuals and groups outside and beyond institutions as knowledge holders, connecting generations and histories, not necessarily through purposeful collecting, but by passing on that knowledge, stories, values, culture, through daily practice and diverse use of landscape. And what happens when such spaces or opportunities are threatened, displaced, or disappear? And this can include, for example, the disappearance for family space in the evenings, or uh, there's a big gap in terms of distance, for example, from grandparents or aunts and uncles. Now, of course, this is not to exclude institutions, but rather understand how places like museums, libraries, and others, including digital platforms, how these allow for exhibitions based on storytelling that elicits multiple narratives and inclusivity in which ordinary men and women are part of that story. So we are keen to identify opportunities that balance sensitively the striving for future visions and re-energizing of relations, especially in post-conflict contexts, with appropriate modes of memorialization of difficult pasts, which prevent overwriting and erasure, yet allow for reconciliation, as well as voluntary overcoming or forgetting. So key for us is to identify and encourage dialogical space and to create a meaningful and fit for purpose repository, whether material or performative that hosts these stories, which would allow for remembrance and leaving some memories in the past with the knowledge that they are safe from erasure. In some cases, removing the story from everyday life can allow for healing, especially in context of intergenerational trauma, and a path for a path towards restitution, repair, and reconciliation of what we refer to as unfinished business. And many of our projects speak to difficult, unresolved, or displaced pasts and their caretakers. They foreground the potential for memory institutions and archival practices to provide shared custodianship, 
spaces for dialogue and multiple narratives. He also exposed how stories live in landscapes, are vocalized, materialized, and impact everyday life. And these elements are foundational for imagining futures through an archived past, which is funded by the Art and Humanities Research Council in the UK uh, under the umbrella of UKRI through their Global Challenges Research Fund. And the project overall runs from 2020 to 2024. But that doesn't really uh, summarize in any way the tremendous amount of energies and contributions that are made by colleagues from all different backgrounds spread across many geopolitical spaces. So our Imagining Futures team, a summary of which you can see on this slide, includes a numerous practitioners and colleagues who all came together some three years ago now to think expansively about the many forms of archiving practices. So at the core, we have five laboratories, or what we call labs, based in Ghana and Tanzania, in Beirut, in Badawi Camp, and in central St. Martins in London. These teams, along with other partners and advisors, created Imagining Futures, and some of these include Serbanism, the British Museum, Vendanda Abbey, among others. And the whole point was that each started with a response to the needs of their particular context. And in this way, they function as the engines and create the building capacity. We have so far had two phases of open calls for our main commissions, along with other smaller grants. And so uh, we've also just shortlisted a series of um, people who are gonna be carrying out projects for our second phase of open call commissions. So in total, we support about 50 initiatives and the, uh, our team, or if you'd like, Imagining Futures family is over hundred colleagues strong now. But we are also, what we're also very excited about is that we are bringing in new knowledge holders from new uh, contexts, including that of Central South America, of Asia, and also Aboriginal contexts in places like Australia. Um, our project also incorporates 13 MA fellows who we support, and we are very much looking forward to um, hosting them at a conference um, in South Africa with Abercrest um, in December. And in addition, we've just appointed two postdoctoral research fellows, Aoife McNeese and Alufemi Adetunyi, and these colleagues will help us to kind of coordinate the manifesto of egalitarian archival practice, and also to set up a distributed repository hub, which will be hosted with our colleague Kocho Gavua and uh, the repository that he set up in Accra, which is at the Leventus Digital Resource Center at the University of Ghana. So in the remaining time that I have, what I would like is to show you a bit of a kaleidoscope of, project, of projects with a few examples. Um, and here's one kaleidoscope. And the one I'm going to explore with first, but very briefly, because um, these colleagues have their own tremendous presentations about the details of the work that they do, is what we are calling our lab in Tanzania with our hosts, Nancy Rushahora and Valence Salayo, both archaeologists and Dar es Salaam. And their work draws on Nancy's research that seeks to uncover multiple narratives of the Maji Maji War, which was fought against German colonialism in southern Tanzania in 1904 to 1908. The Tanzania Lab, which has catalyzed many of the initiatives that we'll be uh, presenting and spearheaded key strands essential for understanding approaches to egalitarian archival practice. So as I say, I will talk about them not in very much detail, but quite briefly, but just to give you a sense of the kind of things that these colleagues are engaging in. Um, where there's a focus on collecting memory, archives are in part created by listening to third and fourth generation victims of colonial violence in a lot of these projects to understand how interaction with sites and landscape of trauma affects such memories. And these include key sites of memorialization and heritage and archives in Tanzania, such as the Songea monuments that you could see here, and also in connection to it, the Songea Museum, which deals with the Maji Maji War and a lot of its heroes, but it also includes other sites which um, speak not only to remembrance, but also how stories of violent and difficult past are told and where they live, and which concern unfinished business of understanding the spaces between genocide and resistance. So here's an image um, of the Lindy prison, which I'll come back to in a bit. One of the ways that we understand this is by listening to the multiple narratives of the ways to activate sites 
with elders at the Songhea Museum. And this allows for connectivities and explorations of dissensus methodologies where there might be diverging narratives. It also includes the youth who are part of these considerations and discussions and who have different ways of approaching ways of thinking about these sites into the future. Um, here, what you see in the center is Chief Zulugama of the Wangoni of Songhea coming to a workshop in Dar es Salaam. And he told us stories of his ancestors, some which were in the photos um, from the Maji Maji War at the National Museum. He talked to May students such as Zuhura Matumbutsi, helping to rethink the exhibitions of the National Museum and others and connect them with sites such as the museum in the south of Tanzania and Songhe. Connected with these sites are others, such as the Lindy Prison that I've already mentioned. And here, a lot of the heroes of the war were held and then executed. And the prison continued to be active until 1970s, until it was abandoned and now sits as a ruin in the middle of Lindy. What's interesting about Lindy is it's a very rich, culturally rich area with a lot of energy in the community. Well, for example, with not yet any culture centers. So one of the things we're thinking about is whether together with the communities, um, we can think about creating this into a kind of memory center. And the site, as you see here, was activated with local schools with their own tellings of the Maji Maji War. They did this through a reenactment. And unlike some of the museum sites, which only include primarily men who are heroes, here the young people reimagined with women and children included whole families with a different meaning of hero. And they did this not just through colonial or other kind of photographs and portraits, but through singing, through dancing, through rapping. And the kind of ways that they came up with retellings are now being included in an education pack that's been produced by Nancy with her own research about the Maji Maji War and distributed as, um, as almost textbooks in schools and along with other people like even the vice president in Tanzania who's very interested in these, um, in this new way of telling of the Maji Maji War. So these made the first step into thinking about reconstructing the site of this potential memory center and extending custodianship to the next generation, making the ownership of the past inclusive. The other uh, voices that we like to include are those, for example, of Chief McKenzie. When you Chief Chief McKenzie's grandfather, Mwenyi McKenzie, received the missionaries. Um, uh, and in fact, it was the land that their family owned or that looked after where the Benedictine Abbey in Danda was created. As you can see here, there are documents like this, which exist in archives and copies are held by, uh, by members of the community, such as the chief. The Nanda Abbey holds precious archives. And one of the reasons they are so precious is because they have archives that tell of stories prior to the Maji Maji War, and they were there during the Maji Maji War, so are witnesses to it. And our way, um, one of the things we're trying to do is find ways to understand what it is in the archive and egalitarian ways to make these records accessible. And we are doing this work with Abbot Christian, Father Tuzindi, and as you can see there, Nancy Wishahor and myself as well. As part of this landscape are also coastal sites, such as those of Mugao, which has a different heritage landscape. And this is a fishing village. Here, along with colleagues, Peter Campbell, an underwater archeologist, and Anwar Hanna, who's an architect, we discussed with the community ways that they may want to integrate their heritage through restoration with other coastal sites for a wider story and provide local generation of income and possibly sensitive tourism. And the sensitivity is important here for engagement so to make sure that it does not impact on the fishing and other practices that are so key to the community's survival. So now what I'd like to do is move on to some of the other projects. Here's, a, sorry, here's an example of the Mgao site and the architect, Edward Hanna, um, who was taking images of it then. And we are now working between architects uh, of his group with Serbanism and those in Tanzania, a ways to think with the community of how to reactivate the site. Moving beyond uh, East Africa, um, here I'm going to just go through a few of the other projects that uh, might be of interest and that are definitely incredibly powerful in all of us thinking about egalitarian archival practices in different ways. So we have our colleagues in Ghana who've been working with particularly youth in Jamestown, which is outside of Accra, into rethinking the whole role of memory institutions in Ghana. 
so that the value of museum collections, displays, and other cultural resources is jointly created as veritable archives that safeguard and display such resources. They recently launched an exhibition on the theme of boxing, which is central to Jamestown history and the present day, as it forms part of local songs and dances, celebrations, and it is cross-generational, including both men and women. It celebrates boxing as a heritage asset that enhances the social cohesion and harmony within the community. And more broadly, it helps to stimulate the discourse of how people would like to retell stories of their past beyond the official narratives. Moving beyond, uh, but very much connected to Africa, the reimaginings that we just saw in Lindy Prison triggered a dialogue with Ellen Epidine Kazmi and Yusuf M. Kazmi about the old bomb shelters and Badawi refugee camp in North Lebanon set up in the 1950s, which is built into the foundations of the current Anarwa schools and a presence which remains an unfinished past. These form part of exploring stories of Badawi refugee camp through neighborhoods and lifeways by the current inhabitants, including some who are of Palestinian and African descent. Unlike in Ghana, the stories here are not necessarily for public access, partly because of the ongoing sensitivities in having the stories in the open, but also because often people in context of displacement are constantly archived by others. So the storytelling, poetry, photographs, and other explorations within Badawi refugee camp are co-designed by and for the purposes and needs of the people who are and have been there. In writing the camp archive, Yusuf M. Kazmier confronts these issues through his poetry. The poems deal with a paradox of spatiality, memory, and custodianship and displacement. Uh, one of the paragraph poems, The Anthropologist, I'm going to read to you just the last bit. He writes, all of us wanted to greet her. Even my illiterate mother, who never spoke a word of English, said, welcome. After spending hours with us in the same room, she left with a jar of homemade pickles and three full cassettes of our voices. The meaning of archiving in the camp and in displacements leads to difficult questions of ways that displaced stories exist as part of the world and not just in the spaces in between. Where does the story live? Who does it belong to? Who are its custodians? How to ensure that life lived in displacement is recognized not only as painful, but meaningful, and that those who endure it also have stories of lives beyond displacement. How do we ensure such practices take place in time to reduce the risk of eviction in the first place and prevent erasure through overriding and overbuilding, especially by urban master plans? And this is very much at the center of the work at Yarmouk Camp by Edward Hanna and Nur Harastani of Serbanism and their collective of young architects in Syria and the diaspora. The camp near Damascus was once the largest unofficial Palestinian refugee camp housing possibly 600,000 people. Now it stands empty following its destruction between 2013 and 2018. And one of the things that stopped repopulating the camp is the pasture plans and what they've done in terms of erasure of social fabric. The work that uh, Serbanism is doing with uh, neighbors of Yarmouk camp shows not only Yarmouk as a refugee camp, but a historical milestone of social cohesion between Syrians and Palestinians of 50 years of living together. And it uses storytelling to present memories of this camp from different perspectives, with the hope that um, it will form a baseline for broader engagement on a regional level and with the authorities. Averting erasure and potential displacement by intrusion of master plans is at the core also of Carantina in Lebanon, the project there. This is one of the neighborhoods that was destroyed during the recent port blast in Beirut in August of 2020. The site of multiple traumas, it remains a marginalized and vulnerable neighborhood with many who have low incomes making it their home. The aim is to develop a participatory model of recovery which is community-based and bottom-up. And that is being conducted by citizen scientists in partnership with our team, led by Hawaida Alhariti there, as well as others such as Batulu Asim, who are part of the Beirut Urban Lab. And the work of the lab strives for models of reconstruction that incorporate diverse understandings of the value that ensure preservation of the multi-layered fabric of sites and their social networks. 
And the methods that are being developed in Quarantina in Beirut intersect with those of In Search of LA, led by Tony Paul and her public history team in California, which will be this last of my kind of stories for today. Here, creating a digital hub for documenting histories and telling stories about LA neighborhoods, it aims to identify and gather resources from across the city to allow a collaborative history making. So this includes a digital exhibition of LA's lost neighborhoods of ghosts in the landscape, telling the story of three neighborhoods occupied predominantly by people of color that were overwritten in the 20th century. The LA stories, streetscapes, and names, many of been, which have been changed, is treated as repositories of memory and identity, constituting an archive, if you'd like, of city texts. The co-created exhibition focuses on mobile history and serves as an act of social justice of remembering these neighborhoods and the communities who live there. The project engages public audiences in civic history through everyday spaces they inhabit. So these are some of the aims of our joint efforts to build methodologies of egalitarian archival practices to help address difficult and violent pasts, to counter erasure and overwriting, and to allow space for multiple voices and of divergent narratives that prevent that single we. Importantly also, it is to showcase the way stories are linked into global life ways, including those of this young journalist and doctor-to-be with whom we exchange stories in Calais in the refugee camp in 2016, just before she and her family were evicted and the camp was physically and violently erased. Thank you very much for letting me share these stories and questions with you to start a conversation about the diverse ways and places that memory, pasts, and futures are negotiated. Thank you very much. <laughs>